Hello and welcome to this impromptu podcast, formerly a video podcast, but my camera decided it was not going to work today. Uh, this podcast will be talking about the book Without Conscience, a The Disturbing World of the Psychopaths Among Us, a book primarily about, as its name would suggest, psychopathy and psychopaths. And this book was written by Robert D. Hare. So in kind of starting off this podcast, I want to start by uh, introducing you all to the author. Robert D. Hare, Ph.D., is considered to be one of the world's foremost experts on psychopathy. He is a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of British Columbia, Canada. He is the developer of the most widely used tool for assessing psychopathy, the, psycho the Psychopathy Checklist. And he is the author of over 100 scientific articles and several books, he has additionally received numerous awards for his distinguished contributions to both psychology and criminology. Uh, of note is that his use of the psychopathy checklist has often been with populations of prisoners or with general prison populations. And so this particular book, Without Conscience, is segmented into different chapters, starting off with an introduction that talks about a very general gist reference of you know, what is a psychopath, going into the experience of a psychopath, talking about what, in layman's terms, it is to experience the world from a psychopath's point of view. Uh, Robert Hare then focuses the picture uh, more towards the clinical definitions of psychopathy, focusing on the profile, or the feelings and the emotions, the interpersonal side of, a, of the syndrome that is known as psychopathy, and then taking it to the other side of the actions, the antisocial behaviors or the lifestyle that makes up psychopathy. He then moves towards internal controls. What is the missing piece that makes someone a psychopath? Uh, and then turns to crime, as is his focus and where he has received much of his esteem, uh, crime and psychopathy, then shifting to white-collar psychopaths, or as he defines it, subclinical psychopaths, or subcriminal psychopaths in his particular definition, being psychopaths in the workforce, and psychopaths specifically in the white-collar world. The following three chapters focus on really talking about what it is to be a psychopath, what things you should be looking out for, different ways to spot a psychopath, and then delving into what are the roots of psychopathy. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Hint, it's both. Uh, following is the a brief discussion of the ethics of labeling. What does it mean to label someone, especially at an early age, a psychopath? knowing that they are very resistant to any kind of treatment or change, what are the ethics of that label? That's briefly discussed. And then the book finishes off with the question of can anything be done? And what do you do? How do you survive in a world where there are psychopaths? In a world where you will at some point interact with a psychopath? And the book ends, finally, with an epilogue, a brief epilogue, that sums up most of the book and adds a few personal notes. And so the way that I will personally be approaching this book will be slightly different from a classic book review of just talk about exactly what the book discusses uh, as a summary, because I want to address this from the perspective of work from the perspective of industrial organizational psychology. What can this tell me or tell our profession as industrial organizational psychologists? And so, before saying anything, I think one of the key locations to begin this discussion is in figuring out, well, what is a psychopath? 
And Robert Hare defines you know, the very base meaning, right? The word psychopathy in and of itself literally means an illness of the mind, or psyche, the mind, pathos, disease. And that's often the same definition that we still find in many dictionaries, a disease of the mind. In a more clinical sense, psychopathy is a personality disorder defined by a distinctive cluster of behaviors and inferred personality traits, most of which society views as pejorative. In so saying, it is a, a collection of personality traits and behaviors, or a syndrome, and that collection is viewed by society as generally pejorative. And so, within that definition, and within popular media, and often in coverage, even in a research context, there is often confusion between the difference of what is a psychotic person, what is a sociopathic person, what is someone with antisocial personality disorder, and how do those three things differ from psychopathy? Or do they? And yes, they, they do. And they differ in each in their own unique way. So beginning with psychotic. So unlike a psychotic individual, psychopaths are rational and aware of what they are doing and why they are doing it. Their behavior is the result of the free expression of choice. Whereas someone who is psychotic is irrational or unaware of what they are doing. So a psychotic individual is the one who will be granted an insanity plea in court if they have committed a crime. They are deemed irrational or unaware of what they are doing. However, a psychopathic individual is rational and aware and has flagrantly ignored a certain social, societal, or legal rule. So moving into sociopathy. This is a, a little bit more in a detailed definition, right? So sociopathy comes from a sociological and a criminological basis, where a sociopath is generally termed as such when the syndrome of personality traits and behaviors is forged or viewed as being forged entirely by social forces and early experiences. So that's the sociological and often the criminological view of this syndrome of behaviors and personality traits is that that is socio or sociopathy, a sociopath. The difference between that and psychopathy or a psychopath is from the often what is the research or the psychological view that psychopathy or that this syndrome has psychological, biological, and genetic factors that additionally contribute to the development of the syndrome. And so people with this perspective use the term psychopath. Uh, and that will also be the term used by the author of this book is psychopathy because it is not only social, but it is psychological, it is biological, and it is genetic in and of its nature of creating those syndrome symptoms. And, you know, well, cool. What about antisocial personality disorder? I mean, that's often used as the legitimate alternative terminology. Well, and the difference here is also another kind of finite one of Antisocial personality disorder, used as a, a diagnostic criteria, consists primarily of a long list of antisocial and criminal behaviors. These are objective and socially deviant behaviors. Psychopathy, on the other hand, is defined as a cluster of both personality traits and of socially deviant behaviors in that you can be a psychopath 
without expressing these socially or criminally deviant behaviors. And so to kind of sum up, psychopathy differs from psychotic in that psychopathy is rational. Psychopathy differs from sociopathy in that the perspective on it or the perspective of what underlies those symptoms and underlies that syndrome also takes into account psychological, biological, and genetic factors, not just social factors. And psychopathy differs from antisocial personality disorder in that psychopathy is defined as a cluster of both personality traits and deviant behaviors, not just deviant or criminal behaviors. And so that's all well and good, right? These are, these are great official or clinical definitions of what is psychopathy. But I think where this book really shines is in its narrative definitions of psychopathy, in the way that it describes what the world is to a psychopath. And so kind of one of the more poetic or narrative ways that this book defines a psychopath is that psychopaths are social predators who charm, manipulate, and ruthlessly plow their way through life, leaving a broad trail of broken hearts, shattered expectations, and empty wallets. Completely lacking in conscious and any feelings for others, They selfishly take what they want and do as they please, and violating social norms and expectations, they do that without the slightest sense of guilt or regret. And that the hallmark of a psychopath is a stunning lack of conscience. Cough, cough, the namesake of the book. That their game is self-gratification at another person's expense, and that many times psychopaths are in prison But many times they're not. But always, they take far more than they give. And that's just, it's a wonderful narrative definition of the experience of a a psychopath, right? Chapter two of this book. And then even further into the book, defining why a psychopath will act the way that they do. Right? Psychopaths have little aptitude for experiencing the emotional response, fear and anxiety, that are the mainsprings of conscience. The knowledge of right and wrong, the knowledge of to do or not to do, is based on the emotional response of fear or anxiety to the negative. Without that emotion, conscience does not exist. And so the author defines this as, as the inner speech of psychopaths lacks an emotional punch, that they have a weak capacity for mentally picturing the consequences of their behavior. And one of the, one of the best ways that this was described is that if you imagine emotion as color, a psychopath is colorblind, fully colorblind, in that they can see how others express certain things. They can see the behavior. They can analyze and copy the behavior that goes along with the experience of an emotion. But that emotion, that color, eludes them. They will forever be unable to comprehend or appreciate the emotional value and significance of words and actions and meaning. And so flowing from this kind of beautiful narrative definition that's, that's presented within the book, we then move right around the middle to the concept of, okay, but how do you diagnose a psychopath? Uh, and this is where, you know, as may be expected from the fact that he is the author of the book, Uh, Robert Hare proposes the psychopathy checklist, which talks about the key symptoms of psychopathy. And it splits them into two general categories. There is the emotional and the interpersonal, 
And then there is the social deviance. And so on the emotional interpersonal side, the psychopathy checklists will tell you something like glib and superficial, egocentric and grandiose, having a lack of remorse or guilt, lacking empathy, being deceitful and manipulative, and having shallow emotions, or seeming to be putting on a display of emotion without the experience of those emotions. On the social deviance side, there are such things as impulsive, poor behavioral controls, a need for excitement, a lack of responsibility, a record of early behavioral problems, and a record of adult antisocial behavior. And so here is where, you know, from the definitional component, from the narrative component, onto this first concrete checklist, is where we, as the field of IO psychology, can begin to, you know, look here and say, well, how can we apply this? Well, one way is to look for these things, look for glibness and superficiality, egocentrism and grandiosity, a lack of remorse or guilt, a lack of empathy, continuous deceit or manipulation or the display of shallow emotions. We can look for impulsiveness, poor behavioral controls, a need for excitement, the lack of willingness to take responsibility. We can look for behavioral problems and antisocial behavior. And this is a first way where in selection or in continued evaluation, organizations can look and say, you know, is this person a psychopath? Is there a danger here that we don't want to allow to harm or destroy a team, another individual, a company, etc.? And we'll get on to this a little bit later in the book and a little bit later in this podcast of the white-collar psychopath and how they can be very successful at a very great harm. And so, as I said, this is one of the first places in the book where myself as an industrial organizational psychologist and coming from that perspective can say, all right, here are the things that we need to be looking for. Even if it's not a perfect definition, someone who has an amalgamation, right? This is a syndrome. It's not just one or two. And that's a big point of this book is you can know people who are egocentric and grandiose. Maybe they're impulsive. Maybe they have a lack of remorse or guilt. But it is the syndrome, it is the combination of these things that makes a psychopath. And so the combination of these things is what you can look for in a work team or in an, in, in, pardon me, in an individual or taking it one level of abstraction further. If you have a work team where one member has the glibness and the egocentriality, another one has the impulsiveness and the need for excitement, another one has the lack of empathy and the shallow emotions, the possibility, although mostly untested at this point in research and, and in literature, that that team could become, in effect, a psychopathic team. That team could act as a psychopath in and in and of itself as an entity with those individuals included. And that's kind of an expansion, but on, on a small scale, you can look for these things to identify who could be a potential harm to an organization or to a team. And so from that point in the book on, we really get into, okay, why do IOs care? Why would we give a crap? Uh, about psychopathy. Isn't that just the realm of the, you know, the abstract? It's the realm of the sociologists and the criminologists and maybe the, the abnormal psychologists, but that's not IO. But, you know, as I just expressed, you know, that's one way where it can apply in an IO context. Uh, but there's also coming with that the knowledge of the prevalence. Psychopathy viewed as an abnormality viewed as the aberration from the norm or this maybe viewed as like, oh, these are the serial killers, the Ted Bundys, the, uh, 
the Edward Geens, like these are the crazy people. They're not, we're not going to see them in, you know, your day-to-day work. You're not going to come across someone who's murdering people in their basement. Well, th- that's the big problem. It's not that. <laughs> and so as in the book, they describe, you know, serial killers are extremely rare. We, we know that. Viewing all psychopaths as serial killers is wrong. You may view many serial killers as psychopaths, sure, but not the other way around. And so the book makes a great point of, you know, serial killers are extremely rare. There are probably fewer than 100 serial killers in North America. However, in contrast, there may be as many as 2 to 3 million psychopaths in North America. And so even if all serial killers are psychopaths, this would mean that for every psychopath who is a serial killer, there are another 20 to 30,000 psychopaths who do not commit that serial murder. And in considering that there are 2 million psychopaths in North America, you could say that the citizens of New York City, just New York City, may have as many as 100,000 psychopaths among them. Right? That's prevalent. That's more prevalent than just those weird examples of the Ted Bundys and the, and the serial killers and the crazy, crazy events that go up on the news or in the movies. That's two to three million people. And so the book mentions right up front, I mean, in the introduction, it is very likely that at some point or some time in your life, you will come in contact, rather you will come in painful contact with a psychopath. And so we know, it's widely known, that the average person will spend around 90,000 hours of work, uh, rather 90,000 hours at work throughout their lifetime. The majority of people who do work spend the majority of their day at work. And so chances are, if you're running into these two to three million people, if you live in New York, you to run into one of these 100,000 people, you're going to run into them at work. And so that alone should be enough of a reason why I and why the field of industrial organizational psychology should be interested in psychopaths, in psychopaths at work, in the individuals who have psychopathic tendencies at work. Because if we're talking about two to three million full psychopaths, there are millions more who have psychopathic tendencies. And you are almost guaranteed to work with, to work for, or to have working for you a psychopath or multiple. And so it is critical to know how to deal with that, how to engage with these people or identify these people and make sure, you know, foolproof, in, in, in many cases, you could compare it to baby proofing, but to psychopath proof your business. And to kind of add one last point on the, on the prevalence, the, the book gives a really good quote that many psychopaths never go to prison or any other facility. They appear to function reasonably well as lawyers, as doctors, psychiatrists, academics, mercenaries, police officers, cult leaders, military personnel, business people, writers, artists, entertainers, and so forth, without ever breaking the law, or rather, at least without being caught and convicted, but that the underlying personality traits of these people do not change. They have just learned how to satisfy their urges without becoming abreast of the law. And this book also mentions, I think, a very key quote uh, in terms of the field of industrial organizational psychology and, and businesses in general, and that psychopaths climb corporate ladders very quickly. They are outstanding at self-promotion. <laughs> 
they can muster amazingly charming and charismatic performances, but as the book mentions, these performances are a snake's charm, which is also kind of a great nod to another good book on psychopaths, specifically psychopaths within the white-collar world, which is Snakes in Suits. Great book, not this book, but (laughs) that talks about the white-collar world and how psychopaths are able to succeed in this world. And so on the note of the white-collar psychopath, right now we're getting towards the back end of the book, and Robert Hare talks about the, the example of Dave. And Dave ranked highly on the psychopathy checklist. He was a psychopath. And it showed in his lack of control, in his being rated continuously poorly on performance and on his relationships with others in the workplace. His boss, every single performance review, evaluated him poorly. And yet, from an organizational point of view, Dave was incredibly successful. He had two promotions in two years. He received large salary increases despite the negative performance evaluations from his boss and from his peers. And he was eventually included into a corporate succession plan as a high-potential employee. And so the question was kind of raised throughout this chapter of, well, how did he do this? And the answer was that he had the ability to strategically manipulate the upper management into believing his view rather than anyone else's for more than two years. Right, and this gets at the idea that psychopaths, they can cause harm, they can be ineffective, but they are masters at manipulation. And they are masters at knowing exactly who to manipulate and how to manipulate them in order to get the result that they want. And so Robert Hare defines this uh, really well as psychopaths have what it takes. They just have what it takes to defraud and to bilk others. They're fast talking. They're charming. They're self-assured. At ease in social situations. They're cool under pressure. Unfazed by the possibility of being found out. And they're completely and totally ruthless. Going on to say that even when exposed... They just carry on as if nothing has happened. And that often leaves the accusers kind of bewildered and uncertain about their own position. Right? When you catch someone in a lie and they're just like, yeah, all right, and they keep going. It brings forth this confusion. And so these these psychopaths are built to lie, to manipulate, and to use others and organizations for their own benefit. And so, towards now the back end of the book, we've talked about what a psychopath is, how psychopaths see the world, kind of the different ways you can evaluate and look at a psychopath. And now, at this point in the book, Robert Hare moves to, okay, what can we do? And one of the most important points in the what can we do was actually, what can't we do? You know, what doesn't work? And notably, he mentions that with very few exceptions, the traditional forms of psychotherapy, including psychoanalysis, group therapy, client-centered therapy, and psychodrama, have been ineffective as a treatment for psychopathy. And biological therapies, like psychosurgery, electroshock therapy, and various drugs have also been ineffective at the treatment of psychopathy. And he notes that one of the most important elements for success in a treatment, especially in the therapy treatments, is that the patient has to see that there's something wrong. And a psychopath does not view themselves as having anything psychologically or emotionally wrong. So they see no reason to change their behavior. 
And he defines this by saying, you know, psychopaths are not fragile. Very notably, they are not fragile. They have a rock-solid personality structure. And that structure is extremely resistant to outside influence. People weaker than them, people with emotions, are just weaker and ready to be used. They deserve to be used for the psychopath's benefit. And almost ironically, most therapy programs, not only do they not help psychopaths, they have been proven to actually provide psychopaths with new excuses and new rationalizations for their behaviors, or new insights into human vulnerability that they can then use and exploit. And so, one of the, I think, the key pieces of advice in this entire book, relevant for every context when dealing with a psychopath, is the following on page 205. If you are dealing with a true psychopath, it is important to recognize that the current prognosis for significant improvement in his or her attitudes or behavior is very poor. That is to say, if you have come across a psychopath, you're not going to change them. You're not going to treat them and then have them not be a psychopath. You're going to treat them and then have them learn how to present as if they've become better, and all the time they will be exactly the same person. They will be the exact psychopath who went into training, but a little bit more skilled. And so, from an organizational point of view, from an I.O. perspective, this is very relevant in considering how to address the concept, the topic, the prevalence of psychopathy in the workforce. It is to say that attempting to treat, or in many cases, attempting to train away these tendencies that are part of a psychopathic syndrome will fail. They will be ineffective. And so training is not the correct avenue of correction to take for, for these people who are psychopaths or who show notably psychopathic tendencies and uh, an amalgamation of these tendencies. It is important to not focus on training as a solution but to focus on other avenues, and I'll get to those in a moment. And so in this latter half of the book, uh, Robert Hare talks about, you know, what are some things you can look at? Well, you can look at their hands. They go into a really cool, you know, discussion of psychopaths actually use more beats, or those, the micro-hand movements while you talk. In general, these beats, these micro-hand movements, will go along with major thoughts. And so because psychopaths have that sporadic thought pattern, because they're linking words that usually people will link with emotion and an underlying theme and have kind of fewer beats because these are bigger units, psychopaths take these each as individual units of you know, unemotional, neutral content, so they're using more hand movements and more beats. Cool. Not really useful in a... In an applied context, but still interesting. It notes that their thought line is generally fragmented, and that goes with the beats, right? That they struggle to stay on one theme, one underlying theme, and that they are prone to frequently changing topics or going off on irrelevant tangents or, you know, failing to connect certain phrases and sentences uh, in fact, they're, they're notorious for not answering the questions that are posed to them. But unfortunately, and I think the almost the takeaway from that section of the book, is that in short, these oddities in speech and movement are very often too subtle for the casual observer to actually detect because these psychopaths are putting on a good show. So we're often sucked in to not what they say, but how they're saying it and how they're portraying a very charismatic persona, how they're very targetedly pushing 
the exact buttons that will get us to do what they want us to do. And so Robert Hare, you know, gives a little a little quip that I think applies really well to psychopaths that in many ways they resemble immensely skilled storytellers in that they understand who they're talking to. They understand exactly how to manipulate and push buttons to get that person to do what they want them to do. And so that's just, I mean, that part of the book was supposed to be like, here's how you see them. And then it ends by saying, you're not going to see them. <laughs> you're just, you're done. You're done so. You're not going to see it. And you're going to get drawn in. It's like, okay, cool. Uh, so now we move on to, now we're in these last like three chapters. And Robert Hare kind of puts forth these big cautions. You know, here are the, here are the signs you should look for. Or the things that you should be aware of so that you don't get taken advantage of. First one is, if you have any weak spots in your psychological makeup, a psychopath is sure to find them and exploit them. Another is that loneliness is one of the most exploitable feelings, emotions, states. Uh, in his words, the callous use of the lonely is a trademark of psychopaths. Additionally, psychopaths have no hesitation in making use of someone's need to find purpose in their life uh, or in preying on the confused, the frail, or the helpless. They'll take advantage of your hang-ups, your self-doubts. They have an uncanny ability to spot those who are nurturant, right? those who feel that they need to help and mother others, and they will utilize and drain them. And he also mentions as one of the big cautions that in some cases, the victim simply refuses to believe that he or she is really being taken advantage of. And I think this is the point. The other cautions are, are kind of useful in uh, an interpersonal sense. This one is useful in a larger organizational sense, uh, or in, in my case, in an IO sense. That in some cases... Victims simply refuse to believe that they're being taken advantage of, and that this psychological denial is an important mechanism for screening out painful knowledge from consciousness, in, in blinding us from the truths that are obvious to others. And so the application therein is that in many cases, as say as a consultant, as an IO consultant, I could go into an organization and see something that is very obviously one party or one element or one individual taking advantage of another party, element, or individual. And it is very easy to be influenced by the way that everyone else starts talking about that occurrence. We're like, no, 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 this, that's not what this is. They're the most charming, they're the best, you know, individual or group or this, that, or the other, is to not be swayed by that. And for, you know, a leadership side, to not be swayed by the charisma of someone who is working for or with you, but focusing on the tangible product, the outcomes, the actual behaviors and performance. Because ultimately, that is where you can gain that insight. You won't gain it from this interpersonal charisma or from the way that some people you know, will deny that, well, I'm not being taken advantage of, we, I'm just a really good friend. I, he's great, he's really charismatic, doesn't matter. You're going to see it in the actual outcomes, the actual behaviors, and the actual performance. And then in the last two chapters, the book ends on some pieces of advice. First, pieces of advice that are more general and more kind of applicable to before you come in contact with uh, a psychopath or if you're not sure whether or not you have contact with a psychopath. And then the latter set of advice is for if you've come in contact with a psychopath and you have been burned. And so in this first section of advice, right, the, the general advice, there are certain, uh, I'll, I'll list a few and then I'll target in on the ones that I think are most applicable to me and, and to IO psychology. And so the first piece of advice is know what you're dealing with. And this, I think, is 
very broad but very relevant to any level of this, uh, this interaction with a psychopath. As a consultant, I should know what a psychopath is, how they interact, how they think. I should know that training isn't going to work. And that there have to be certain elements in place to control and keep accountability so that a psychopath who enters the workforce cannot do damage. The same thing for the people who are being hurt, for the leaders who are leading a psychopath, or for the employees who are working with a psychopath. Knowing that certain things, you know, are going to happen, or, or these are the ways that psychopaths think can be immensely helpful in making sure that a psychopath cannot ultimately harm or destroy a dyad, a team, or an entire organization. Another inf uh, piece of advice was not to be influenced by what Robert Hare defined as props, which is, it's very easy to pay attention to the captivating characteristics of the people you meet, whether that be dazzling looks, powerful presence, mesmerizing mannerisms, a smooth voice, rapid-fire verbal pitch, or, or so forth. It's not to be distracted by those things. And that often psychopaths will use uninterrupted and, and intense eye contact as one of their mechanisms to throw off victims and to, to portray this power and this mesmerizing presence. And so, as an almost interpersonal piece of advice it would be not to fall for those mesmerizing characteristics. And if you have to, close your eyes so that you can truly listen to what is being said rather than being distracted by the mesmerizing verbal or, or physical or visible pieces. And so if I had to connect that to an industrial organizational context, right, I would say... This is a great example of why interviews should not be the primary selection mechanism. Because a psychopath will crush an interview. A psychopath will leave an interview with these amazing praise and the, oh, they were amazing and they're captivating and charismatic and assured of themselves. And if that's your only mechanism for hiring or for selection, you're going to end up with psychopaths and they're not going to be positive for your business because although they can come across that way, they have no need to follow actual rules. They will harm others. They will burn you and your organization. And so the last three pieces of advice kind of go together in a way. It's don't wear blinkers. Or, in a way, don't show your buttons. Don't show others your weaknesses. Then keep your guard up in high-risk situations. I'll come back to that in a moment. And know yourself. Because psychopaths are skilled at detecting and ruthlessly exploiting your weak points. They can find your buttons and they can press it to get you to do what they want you to do. And so your best defense is to understand what your weak spots are and to be extremely wary of anyone who zeroes in on them. And so combining those two last pieces of advice, right, keeping your guard up in high-risk situations and knowing your weaknesses, broadening that out to an organizational context, you could say it is equally as important to know your organization's weaknesses to know your department's weaknesses, to know your team's weaknesses, and to be cautious of anyone who zeroes in on them for any particular reason. In addition, with regard to high-risk situations, identify and know what is a high-risk situation, an interaction with a client, access to funds, promotions and being put on those fast tracks to leadership. These are all, when it comes to psychopaths, high-risk situations. Anything that is high-reward or high-access can be considered a high-risk situation. 
Because a psychopath, if given access or if given that power, will inevitably cause an increased level of harm. And they won't care. Because there's no emotional connection to utilizing organizational funds or to blowing a meeting with a client because they annoyed you or because you felt like it. So organizationally, identification of not only weak spots, but identification of high risk, high reward, and high access situations or grants is immensely important in making sure that an organization or a team or a department is almost baby-proofed or or psychopath-proofed in such a way that they cannot be taken down or easily destroyed or manipulated by a psychopath in their ranks. And so the final section of the book talks about, you know, sometimes you just don't see it coming. Sometimes you just, you get screwed over by, by someone who was a psychopath, who had you fooled, who you thought, you know, they were, they, you know, they were so great and I believed all of these things that they told me and you just get, get screwed over. And so Robert Hare gives uh, nine pieces of advice. I'll only focus on about three of them. But these pieces of advice are obtain professional advice. Don't blame yourself. Be aware of who the actual victim is, because psychopaths are very good at making themselves out to be the victim. Recognize that you're not alone. Be careful of power struggles, because that is where psychopaths are not only the most effective, but often the most violent. Set firm ground rules. This will be the key that I'll return to later. Don't expect dramatic changes. As we've talked about, you're not going to change a psychopath. You're just going to teach them how to manipulate you better. Cut your losses. In this case, don't get drawn back in to the psychopath's view or the the psychopath's story or narrative. Cut your losses and don't lose more. And use support groups. Because there are other people who have been screwed over. There are other people who are experiencing the same thing. And you can use those support groups to kind of rebound uh, and to not be as you know, personally destroyed. And so going back to kind of three of these as keys for IO psychology. The first is obtaining professional advice. In this case... Going all, hearkening all the way back to the biggest caution of you should know what a psychopath is. If we as IO psychologists know what a psychopath is and how they work and how they can harm, then we can be one of the professional sources of advice for organizations, for individuals who have been harmed. Because... Without that knowledge of you know, what is a psychopath, how do psychopaths work, we can almost be ineffective in certain situations of saying, well, well, maybe it's this structural thing that, that didn't work, or maybe this person just kind of sucks, but like, no, 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 we have to understand, you know, this person's displaying elements of psychopathy. And so the way they are acting is because they are a psychopath. Right? Being able to be that piece of advice, that, that professional source of solutions, is very important. And in order to do that, that includes having a, at least a basic understanding of what a psychopath is and how they could interact with a workforce. Second piece of advice that, that really hones into the IO side of things is setting firm ground rules. This is one of the best ways to avoid being burned by a potential psychopath. And in its application, that falls on accountability. Having accountability is the best way to make sure, one, people are actually giving you what they're you know, purporting to give you. So if a psychopath who is you know, very keen on or very 
easily throwing out these amazing and charismatic ideas for work and, oh, we should hire this, but we should, you know, promote this person. Well, having that accountability of, are they actually producing these things that they're claiming? Do the products, does the performance match what they are saying? And so this harkens back to the Dave example again of his boss very clearly saw the detrimental impact he was having on the workforce and gave negative reviews. But, you know, a few levels higher up who Dave was actively manipulating, well, they were like, no, 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 whatever. Fast track him, give him raises. He's got these great ideas. He's charismatic. He's emotional just because he was, he made decisions that no one else would make because he had no sense of emotion. And so having a firm structure in place of accountability where if someone is rated poorly on a review that cannot just be ignored is critical. The same thing goes with access. I mentioned that earlier. You know, anything that is high risk, high reward, or high access. If someone is being granted high access, that should be tempered with some kind of accountability of how can you spend these funds that you now have access to? So it's important to have funds externally tracked, or at least internally tracked by another party, to have some kind of accountability where when someone wants to spend money, they have to get it approved by a finance uh, person or a finance department. Various elements that make it so that no matter how grandiose a psychopath wants to act, that is always tempered by some kind of accountability of, did you produce what you said you would produce? Are you actually being rated how you are claiming to be rated? You know, are you using the things that you have access for or access to for proper means? Are you using the money for the way that you should be using the money? How is this tracked? How is this held accountable? That's the crucial way that you can make sure, or at least attempt to make sure, that a psychopath does not destroy a team or a group or an organization from the inside. And the final point is to don't expect dramatic changes. So in this, that falls back on something I mentioned a while ago of you cannot train away psychopathy. You cannot give therapy to or training to or a punishment or reward to a psychopath or a talking, a stern talking to, to a psychopath who does not understand the emotion and who will only learn from those things how to better manipulate everyone. You cannot train it out of them. And so innate to that is once you have identified someone as a psychopath or as displaying psychopathic tendencies, it is critical to be very cautious that if they cause harm, that is not something that you should try to train away. It's not something you should try to fix and then allow them to keep working there. Falls back on the advice of cut your losses and don't expect dramatic changes. Chances are they will not change. They will cause even more harm in the future. It is more beneficial to terminate their employment when you have that ability than to try to keep them around and to try to train them and to try to hope for change that will not come. And so as, you know, as we're coming up on, on the 55-minute the mark of this podcast, I think it's just about time to start wrapping up. And in, in order to wrap up, I think I'll, I'll hearken back to one of the, the first things that Robert Hare said about psychopathy. In, it's very specifically in its difference from a psychotic person that unlike psychotic individuals, psychopaths are rational, they are aware of what they are doing, they are aware of why they are doing it, and their behavior is the result of choice freely exercised. So with two to three million of these people who will act fully in their own self-interest, 
who will harm and take from and leave poorer and more distraught everyone who they come in contact with, with 3,000, rather, 3 million of these people in just North America, in approximately 100,000 of them in New York alone. It is a topic that, although it is easy to ignore and kind of put off as, oh, it's just the serial killers, it's just, it's the aberration from the norm, it is much more beneficial, especially in the field of industrial organizational psychology, in the field of business, in the field of entrepreneurship, to understand what a psychopath is, to understand how they think, how that that lack of color in a world of colored emotions impacts the way that they will process the world and the damage that they can cause to an organization, it is important to keep all of these things in mind. It is important to continue to learn about psychopathy and about psychopaths, because inevitably, in the words of Robert Hare, we will all be burned at some point by a psychopath. So the goal should be to make sure that one, we're not burned, that two, if we are burned, we are not burned twice, and that three, from an organizational perspective, we can both avoid the risk of being destroyed by psychopaths, but that also we may be able to use certain psychopathic tendencies and potentially even use psychopaths for the benefit of an organization and a team and even a dyad, so long as we have measures in place for accountability, for tracking, and for making sure that if those measures are not met, if accountability is broken, if performance is not actually meeting these grandiose ideas, if someone has been caught in an obvious lie, even if they just keep going on as if nothing happened, it is important to have that accountability in place so that we can get rid of them or make sure that we can use them effectively. And so a final takeaway from my IO perspective is it is important to know about psychopaths and even broader, it's important to always consider not only the typical but the atypical. Because in the larger world of work, we will interact with those who fall outside of the normal. And that these people may not be controllable by the same mechanisms that we classically have. They may not be selectable by the mechanisms that we currently have. The structures that are currently in place might reward the harm that they produce more than punish the harm that they produce. And it's critical that we not forget that. That we not forget that people other than the normal exist. That people other than the normal can cause massive harm. And that our structures, our tests, our mechanisms that we are putting in place in an organization should at least be able to account for the possibility of atypical, the possibility of someone who is charismatic, but a psychopath. And although that may sound very much like a cynical or jaded perspective, I think that is truly the takeaway from this book, is that psychopaths are there. The atypical and potentially harmful are there. We will interact with them, It's likely we'll interact with them at work, and when we do, we don't want to be destroyed by them. And I think on that light and happy note, that will be the end of this podcast. I hope you have at least enjoyed, if not learned something from this past hour, and I hope you will tune in if I ever make another podcast. Have a great night, a great day, a great week whatever time you're watching this.
and I will see you in the next.